Tobruk. It's the name of an iconic Australian battle. Yet how many of us actually know what occurred at Tobruk? What really happened there? What was it all about? Where did it all happen? Who was against who? Compared to Gallipoli, we know just about nothing about Tobruk. Every Anzac Day, we individually and as a nation pay our homage and respects to those heroic diggers and how they hit the beaches at Anzac Cove at dawn on April 25th, 1915. And rightly so. We respect that, we revere that, and in many ways it's been the foundation stone upon which our nation's been built. Yet somehow or other, in the first flush of the 21st century, many Australians, especially the younger generations, are not aware of what occurred at Tobruk. It really is another extraordinary story of Australian valour and heroism at war. It's a story of Australian diggers, backed by British artillery, who in extreme desert conditions and severely outnumbered, stood firm against the German military might. The inspiring and binding force in Australian life isn't tradition or nationalism or social revolution. It's quite a simple thing. Henry Lawson called it mateship, the spirit which makes men stick together. In Australia, by sticking together, men have defied drought, bushfire and flood. In Tobruk, they've scorned hardship, danger and death because no digger would ever let his cobbers down. Napoleon Bonaparte called in on his way to conquer Egypt in the late 18th century. But of greater significance to our modern day history was what happened at the beginning of the 20th century when the Italians began to settle in the northern part of Africa. Tobruk Harbour then became where the Italians based much of their Mediterranean fleet. The strategic significance then of Tobruk was really the harbour. If you had the harbour, you could resupply whoever you had in the area. And to ensure that that strategic focal point didn't fall into enemy hands, the Italians, most particularly in the 1930s, began to build about 140 bunkers or concrete ditches around Tobruk to form a defensive perimeter. And they'd certainly not done this in drills for the simple reason that panzers never turned round. They only went forwards. Not this time, no sport. The coup de grace was delivered by the trucks upon which the two pounder guns had been secured. At a distance of about half a mile, these trucks roared in on the flanks of the German tanks, fired several salvos and roared off again before the tanks could get a bead on them. Not only did they score some direct hits on the German tanks, but the trucks were fast enough to get away again before they could be nailed by return post. The resultant chaos was compounded by the fact that, in the heat of all the battle, some of the turrets of the surviving German tanks had now got stuck, grinding to a halt and refusing to respond to the tank's controls. They'd needed maintenance, had not received it, and this was the result. Now, the overall commander of the Panzers, Colonel Olbrich, finally was left with no choice. It didn't come easily to a German tank officer to give the order to retreat, but it was now clear to him that staying was not an option. With British tanks and artillery and Australian anti-tank regiments firing at them from all sides, and with their losses already severe, he felt he had no choice. His order crackled across the radio to the headsets of the other tank commanders. Rucksack! Retreat. And that's the guts of the glory of Tobruk. You basically had the first time in that whole war the Panzers were sent in, 34 of them were sent in, and they turned, and they were turned by the Australians and the Brits essentially for the first time in that war, and only 17 of those Panzers got out. Rommel couldn't believe it. Berlin High Command couldn't believe it. Somehow or other, the German army had suffered its first major defeat in all of that Second World War. Rommel was completely stupefied, could not understand how these sons of convicts, these Australians, nobody even knew what the Australians were doing there. What was that all about? Could stop the might of the Africa Corps. At one point, when Rommel got close to the Australian perimeter and he focused his binoculars upon the Australians, there was an enduring image recorded by his adjutant, Lieutenant Schmidt, and it was an Australian soldier sitting on the parapet of the defences with machine gun bullets splashing around him coming from the German machine guns. And the Australian soldier was waving his slouch hat, basically daring them to have a go. Mediterranean theatre of war. In April 1941, when the lightning Nazi thrust in Libya shot along the coast of Cyrenaica, 
a division of Australians and ancillary troops were detailed to defend Tobruk. Surrounded by the enemy on land, their only supply line was by sea some 400 miles from Alexandria. A matter of three days steam if you travel in this tiny five knot ship. Her crew, Jews, driven from Germany by the Nazis. The chief engineer, Max, on the right, was a U-boat commander in the last war. A German officer, now working for the Allies under the flag of Palestine. So diggers breathe a sigh of relief when the little ship docks safely, bringing a bumper consignment from the Australian Comforts Fund, as well as the ever welcome mail. Tobruk, battered by two campaigns within six months. The reason? It's strategically important harbour. At the barricades, identification cards must be produced. But daring German spies have been caught here. One, wearing an AIF uniform, was actually served at the local canteen. ...when the glorious 9th Division, veterans of the Middle East campaigns, fresh from their desert victories over the Germans, returned to their homeland. Tears of joy as the rats of Tobruk, who had gnawed such holes in Rommel's ranks, were reunited with their loved ones. It was a day to remember in every capital city, as they proudly swung along those thronged thoroughfares, knowing full well that in only a few weeks, maybe days, they'd be facing another enemy much nearer home. Thank you.